We're walking through a cemetery today, and we're thinking of lives that have come and gone. We've just passed through probably 1,600, anywhere from 1,600 to 50 years of human history to 2,200 years in chapter 5, summarized really quickly. So I wanted to begin quickly just looking back at chapter 4 for a couple minutes, summarize what we talked about. I'll tell you, there's a lot in chapter 5. It's packed. It is very full of truth and teaching for us. So thinking back on chapter four, what has happened? You have Cain and Abel. That's what I want to talk about the most. Cain murders his brother. Cain trades the presence of God for the presence of Satan. Cain refuses to offer a bloody sacrifice to God himself. Instead, Cain brings the fruit of the earth as a bloodless testimony to his own self-righteousness. But... Cain will offer the blood of his own brother, dripping from his hands after striking him down. Cain will offer a bloody sacrifice, shouting in triumph over the broken body of Abel. Cain has offered a bloody sacrifice to the God of war, Satan himself. The death of Abel shows that the first war in the Bible is a religious war, as will be the last war. Cain is no atheist or agnostic. He knows the true God, but Cain refuses the true knowledge of God, which can only be received in humility. And instead, Cain chooses the knowledge of good and evil, and he exults in an angry rage over his brother. Cain exults in the fact that he is as God, knowing good and evil. But Satan has the last laugh on Cain, as Satan knows what must happen to Cain in the end. And what of Abel? It looks like the righteous are losers. It looks like they're left with nothing. Abel had no line of children. It says in Psalm 73, 12, Behold, these are the wicked, and always at ease. They have increased in wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. I have been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. Those who want to go the way of faith, like Abel, they seem to suffer, while the wicked seem to prosper. James 5 verse 6 says, You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. John 16 verse 2 says, They will make you outcasts from the synagogue, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. And these things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. What is the end of Abel? Resurrection. What is the end of Abel? Triumph at the end. God saying, well done, good and faithful servant. These two brothers have two different ends. And so the human race has two different pathways in Cain and in Abel. Cain's way looks comfortable, looks rich, looks nice. But you notice of Cain that there's no age given to his descendants in Genesis 4. But there is an age in Genesis 5 for the line of Adam after Seth. There is an age there, but not with the descendants of Cain. Because the descendants of Cain are going to be wiped out, wiped off the earth. And those of Seth will pass into a new world that's about to come. So having said that, let me get a couple of outlines. I call it the descendants of Adam. One to five, Adam's likeness. Six to 27, sons and daughters. 28 to 32, uh, comfort. Comfort, okay. God's appointed seed and generations from Seth to Noah. Verse one, creation of Adam. Two to four, birth of Seth, God's appointed seed instead of Abel. Six to 24, the descendants of Seth to Enoch. And 25 to 32, the descendants of Methuselah to Noah. Okay. Thank you for your outlines. It helps us to think logically and to see what God has to say to us. We're going to go through the questions now for a couple minutes, just have like a rolling conversation about them. First question, what do the first few verses say about God creating Adam, then Adam creating children, so to speak, with Eve? Adam was created in the likeness of God. Seth was created in the likeness of Adam. That 
shows that we are all in the likeness of Adam sinners. Yes, we are all in the likeness of Adam. That is, that is exactly right. It made me think when you read likeness, I think it's more being his representative of good. But you're right. Thank you. And, and you know, the scriptures even tell us more deeply what it means that we bear the image and likeness of God. But then we also bear the image and likeness of Adam. So there's two things happening at uh, the same time. You know that part in verse 2 says he created them male and female. And just to remind you that the image of God, the, the male in one sense represents God's wisdom, and the female represents God's love. Both combine. Both are essential. One's not better than the other. Both are needed to bring forth the full image of God. It's an amazingly wonderful thing. So Adam and Eve are directly made by the finger of God, and then all the kids are Adam's. And there is a change there. Anyone else on that image question? So just to kind of say it like this, I would say to you that the New Testament and the coming of Jesus Christ is meant to restore and to bring us to the full image of God that God always wanted for us. God's purpose is not for men and women to bear the image of Adam in, in a sinfulness, I mean, forever. Jesus Christ came that we might fully have the image and the likes of God all throughout us, body, soul, and spirit. So someone's going to come to the human race and rescue us. But you're seeing the beginning here. Next question. What is the importance of genealogies? Now, I'll tell my kids right here, the purpose of genealogies is not to bore you to death. But no, the genealogies are good. But does someone have a, a thought on that? I think one of the one of the big things about genealogies is it provides detail that is beyond what just mythologies would provide or legends, identifying individual people and who gave birth to whom, who was related to whom. A lot of detail that people who are just making up a story wouldn't include. And so in a way, it's God's handiwork, uh, his way of saying, okay, I want you to understand that this is, this is real, this is literal, this is legitimate. And here's some of the details of it that you can have, and presumably people were able to, to check on it and stuff afterwards. There have been situations where, as the gospel enters a new culture, there have been people have really been taken aback by that. As it listed the genealogy, they say, oh, this must be true, because nobody would go to the trouble of listing a bunch of names. This must be real because there's so much detail there. And so I think that's one of the functions of the genealogies. So the genealogies shows us the factualness of all these lives. These people really live. They're not mythical. They're actual. It's showing what, God, what matters to God. And in, in a way, it's really setting the stage for the next chapter as well. It says there in Genesis 5.1, the book of the generations of Adam. So... Moses got this from somewhere because Moses is compiling the first five books. And this genealogy is part of something else, a more ancient book, which is preserved through the flood. It was preserved. It was kept or, or maybe written right after. We're not sure, but it's an ancient document attached to this ancient document. So God is showing us what's important to him. Why did people live so long? What's the idea of that? Did someone have an answer to that? So people are living a long time so they could have big families. That's one thing to populate the earth. You could say this is the first morning of humanity. This genealogy is anywhere from 1,656 years to maybe like 2,000 years of human history before the flood. It's a lot of time. But these people are living a long time. You could also say that when they're first created, there is a strength and power in humanity that's marvelous. These ancient people were powerful, were brilliant people. These are not cavemen and women trying to start a fire with a stick or two rocks. That's not what these people are. They are brilliant people. They are, like Genesis 4 says also, wicked people, but not everyone's wicked. But their race itself is powerful. And it says in Genesis 6 that God's going to put a time limit on the human race. Does someone remember what that age is, that 
that time limit. 120. 120, yeah. He's going to put a, a limit on 120 years. 900 years is a little bit too long. 120 is going to be the limit. But also in Psalm 90, Moses prays, we could live 70 or maybe 80. If he gets a strength, we'll go to 80. Now, some people go beyond that, of course. So there are limits placed. Limitations are good for us because we need to know how much we need the Lord every day. Every day is important. As Christians, we can't waste a day. Every day is loaded with meaning to walk with God and please God, to call and encourage another brother or sister, to visit someone, to send a letter, pray with someone, to hear someone pour out their heart to you as you listen, to serve others, to bring the gospel of hope to a frightened nation that are so confused by conflicting reports and science and this and that and COVID-19. Every day is so important to live for the Lord Jesus. So whether you have 900 years, 90 or 60, every day matters. It really matters. So the uh, next question I want to ask was about the names. These names in the genealogy, was anybody able to look up, maybe you looked up one of the names. You didn't have to because I have some meaning to. Seth okay. means anointed. Enos means mortal man, sick, or despaired of. I just looked up two. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, so this is what I want to put forth to you very like precisely. These are not randomly occurring names that don't mean anything to us. Remember, Genesis is the book of beginnings. And so God is going to set forth his plan of redemption, his purpose in Christ. He's going to set it forth in Genesis. Then the rest of the Bible will unfold it. So there's something happening here that I would put forth to you that's really pretty amazing and encouraging. But it's actually two sides. There's two things happening. It says here, and they died, right? And they died, and they died, and they died. So Romans 5, verse 12 says this. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of Adam's offense who was a type of him who was to come. So with Adam, what started was is the reign of death. And you see the reign, that's R-E-I-G-N, like the rule of death. But why is there such a rule of death? The rest of Romans 5 is going to tell us that, our, let me say it like this, Genesis 3, 4, 5 is showing a sequence. First there's sin, then sin becomes death, and then death spreads through the human race because of sin. So it's the spreading here that's happening. But why is it happening? It's happening because in Adam, all of us sinned. In Adam, we all sinned. When Adam sinned, we sinned. See, Adam is the representative of the human race. He's the federal head of the race. It's not just that you and I sinned at some point, we're born, and, you know, maybe we're two, two years old, we stole something from the cookie jar and didn't tell our mom, you know. It's not because of that we die. It's because in Adam, when Adam sinned, we all sinned with him at that moment. All of us sinned and fell with him. So people might say this, man, Adam, you blew it. Whoever we are, we might think we, might think we do better than Adam. But don't be so quick. Adam is an incredible man. God made Adam on purpose. God made Adam to represent all of us. And so if he falls, we're all going to fall. It's kind of like if you have a union wanting to bargain with management. There's these talks that happen, and there's negotiations. And you have a couple of negotiators that represent everybody. And what those couple of people achieve, everybody benefits from. Or like the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. We have people we've elected to represent us. And when the House of Representatives votes to go to war, we go to war. If there's a majority saying we're going to go to war, this whole nation is going to war. Because the representatives are doing something on behalf of us. Now you might say, hey, I didn't elect Adam. I got thrown into this thing. Well, 
not so fast. In, in the West, that's, you know, Western Europe and uh, North America, we, we have a wrong way of looking at things. And the wrong way we have is called individualism. Now, individualism is in the scriptures. It's absolutely in the scriptures. But, but we have a way of looking at things where we don't really value our connection with others. That is, in the West, in America, it's very individualistic. But like in the East, India, China, family lines a big thing. Different countries, family lines are really important. So God has a family line. It's really important to him. We all are a family when it comes to Adam and Eve. That's a scripture's viewpoint of it. And that's why all this death in Genesis 5 relates to us, because it's all the same family. But there's something else that comes. Not only is there death, but there's hope. Because in this death, in these 10 names, and I get this from a man named G.D. Watson, that these 10 names represent the work of Christ in the age of salvation. But not only that, because these are real people. And let me tell you what I mean by hope. So what do these names mean? And I'm not trying to say that you can always, in every name in the scripture, find all this stuff which I'm about to say. But in Luke 24, the Lord did talk to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, and he showed them things pertaining to himself in all the scriptures. So what is Adam? He's of the earth. It's like red uh, of the earth. Adam speaks to us of the incarnation of Christ. God became a man for us. He came into our race. Uh, what is the second name? Seth. That's substitute. Christ is our substitute. The Bible pounds that over and over again. Christ is the substitute for us. The third name, Enos, it means mortality or death. That is, Christ must die for us. It's not just that he suffered. It's not so much the sufferings of Christ that save us. It's his death. And Romans is going to pound that home. He died. He died. And you see that in Enos. But what did his death accomplish? Canaan, the fourth man. It means acquisition, to purchase back, to purchase back a lost estate. Christ paid the redemption price for everyone. He paid the debt on the mortgage of this earth that Adam owed to Satan. Adam mortgaged the earth to Satan. Why do you do that, Adam? Christ paid the debt. His death on the cross does everything needed to reconcile the universe back to the Lord. That is, it's acquired. Things are acquired through his cross. Fifth, Mahalalel, splendor of God. That's his resurrection. Christ coming forth, Romans 1, declared to be the Son of God with power by the spirit of holiness. That's his splendor. And the sixth name should be Jared. That's descending. The Spirit of God is given to us in the book of Acts. It's poured out. Jared means pour, pouring out. So God's going to pour out the Spirit upon the church. The seventh is Enoch, and it means to teach or to give instruction. And the work of the Holy Spirit is to instruct God's people. And the um, eighth name is Methuselah, which means released from death. And the Lord Jesus has the power to bypass death for us. That's rapture. We can come to him apart from death. That's Enoch in uh, this chapter. Lamech means conqueror. That is, at the Lord's second coming, he is going to deal with Satan decisively. And Noah is rest. In the millennial age, there will be rest. A new world, the Sabbath, the seventh day will commence universally with Noah, rest. The Lord Jesus bringing rest. So you see, there's a sequence of things. There's hope. There's hope. They didn't all know this then. People didn't all know it all. But the righteous, it says of Enoch, he could see things uh, coming. So I hope that helped so that as you read these chapters in Genesis and other places, these names, especially in Genesis, mean something that are really important to us now. So Hebrews 11 and Enoch, we can't forget Enoch. He is quite a man. Did uh, anybody have something to say about Enoch? What is so special about him and what could he represent? 
he was loyal in walking with God. And I believe, didn't he go to heaven alive? Yes. Yeah. The book of Hebrews talks about him as pleasing God by walking by faith. Yes. Excellent. He was a man who walked with God, he pleased God, and God rewarded him for seeking God diligently. And, and the reward which he got is that uh, he did not see death. You know, with uh, someone like uh, Enoch, remember in uh, the seven days of creation, there's six days plus one. And in that seventh day of rest, there's something about rest which is meant to bind us to God closer and more intimately. We need to work because the six days are needed for work. But in Enoch, God finds a place to rest. God can rest because this man loves him. This man has fellowship with him. It's not necessarily like a busy bee person, though he did stuff and he served the Lord. It's not the point that he's not doing stuff. But he walked with God, that the relationship was primary. And so just as the Lord, for us, wants us to know him through relationship, through intimacy, through closeness, so Enoch got there, and it was by faith. Jude 14 talks about Enoch. It says in, in Jude verse 14, And about these also Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And Hebrews 11, verse 5 and 6, it's by faith Enoch pleased God. But what was his faith? Enoch's faith was preoccupied with the future. With Enoch, the future controlled the present. That's what faith means. The future controls you right now. And Enoch could see the future. And it was almost like past tense. Because he says the Lord came. You know, verse 14, he's talking, he's in the, he's looking at the future but he's, as if it happened. He is in the future seeing these things. He is seeing thousands of his holy ones coming with the Lord Jesus to uh, judge the wicked on the earth, which is, he's actually seen the book of Revelation. Uh, which Apostle John is going to talk, talk more about. But Jude is living there. So what, what happens is that his future expectation determines his present behavior. Because Enoch saw what was coming, he lived in the present for purity, for separation, for devotion, but he wasn't ashamed. He wasn't hiding in the bunker somewhere. Oh, I hope the rain comes soon. I can't stand my neighbors. <laughs> he's not saying that. Oh, these neighbors, they bug me. I'm going to sue them. No, he's not doing that either. What is he doing in Jude 14? He prophesied. He prophesied the seventh from Adam. That's where I get that seventh day of rest, right? Where the Lord rested. The seventh from Adam, God could rest in him. I mean, inside of him. So he's prophesying to his generation. And what is he saying? You know what? You people, what you need is self-esteem. Think positive thoughts and you'll be better. He's not saying that to them. He's not speaking to them in a way that flatters and strengthens them in a life rebellion. He's warning them. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, about the coming kingdom of God, and he's doing it a lot. He's not just one sentence and that's it. He's talking about it like it was his habit. How many years did Enoch walk with God? Who remembers? 365 years. Well, so he's 65. Right? Well, he, he walks with God for 300 years, but at age 65, uh, Methuselah is born. So from the birth of his son to his rapture, it's 300 years. There's Lamech and then Enoch. So Lamech lives 695 years. So Enoch leaves the earth young for that age. But his father is going to live all the way up until five years before the flood. Verse 23, so the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not for God, took him. And Methuselah lived 187 years, being the father of Lamech. And then Methuselah lived 782 years after he became the father of Lamech, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years. But it is Lamech 
who's going to die pretty close to flood. So there's Enoch's faith preoccupied with the future. Enoch's walk, he pleases God in a godless age. And Enoch's reward is rapture. That's his reward. And what you got to know is uh, Enoch gets taken. It's all by grace this happens. Enoch comes to the presence of God all by grace. But what's happening with Enoch? In Hebrews 11, the Lord waves the flag in front of our face about this man. He says, by faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Enoch was rewarded. His faith was rewarded by being taken off the earth. He couldn't just say words, but he had to live out his faith. That's the point. It was his piety. It's his godliness. Not so much talking, though he did talk. He did prophesy. But he walked with God. So it's the same with us. By faith, we get God's grace. And, and we're all going to have difficult situations. Maybe tonight, something will happen in our house. Something difficult will challenge us at home. Maybe tomorrow, something will challenge us. By faith, we can have grace and we can please God. No matter what external thing hits us, we can all walk with God because it's by faith everybody can be like an Enoch because it's told, verse 6, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. So we must believe that he is the all-sufficient one. He is Elohim. He is Jehovah. He is the all-sufficient God. And he rewards those who seek him. Enoch believed that, and he was taken. God will reward us, saints. He absolutely will. In this age and in the age to come, too. Any more thoughts about uh, uh, Enoch? Back to what you said about Enoch and how he saw the future by faith. In his lifetime, the story of redemption is still being played out. And so genealogy written down was more than just names on a list, but it was to signify continuity of family identity and character or purpose. So that genealogy has prophetic significance and inspires faith and trust so that we can continue in that biblical narrative. That's what I was thinking. Yes. Uh, the life of Enoch is written down like this so we could continue in that life. So that Enoch might be lived out in all of us on this Zoom, Zoom call tonight. That life of faith could continue and grow and amplify and magnify it. The salvation we have is not transferable down to generations. So salvation is personal. Uh, yes, sister. Thank you. You know, the passing of the Christian faith is not a natural thing where you have kids and they naturally automatically do, you know, God's will. Everybody in the family of God is there by their own choice, no matter what family you're from. So you could say this line of Adam and these 10 names of hope represent people around the earth who have a chance to join God's family through faith in the Messiah. But you're right. We all have to personally make that choice. Absolutely. God saves us one by one, one by one. So. You see it in Genesis 10, one man, then one man, then one man, then one man. And at the end, it goes to three. There's three now. It's not just one. It's going to be three. It goes Lamech to Noah to Noah's three sons. And so the scriptures is telling us humanity is going to branch in a very unknown way to pretty much everyone on the earth. It's about to happen. Well, not about to. It's going to be another hundred years. But God's going to continue on humanity through these three sons. So you have Lamech, and Lamech is groaning. Lamech sees the planet. He says, this is like, there's a lot of problems here. There's death, there's destruction. If you read the book of Matthew, it says, as in the days of Noah, it'll be in the days of the Son of Man. There was a lot of activity, a lot of commercial activity, but a lot of violence too. And Genesis 6 is going to emphasize it especially. The earth is filled with violence. So Lamech is groaning, groaning in the spirit. And his son is born. And somehow, prophetically, the spirit of God gave us insight. We don't know how or why. But he says, this man is going to bring us rest. And he will. Noah is going to build an ark. Eight people will be in it. The floods of judgment will pour upon the earth. Wipe out everyone who has a breath of life, except those eight and the people in the ark. And then they will come into rest. 
that ark will land on that mountain in Ararat. And then that will be an age of rest, so to speak. It's not the perfect rest because the sin will start all over again. But in a pre-filament, that will happen. Noah will go from an old world to a new world. And in coming to that new world, it prefigures the second coming of Christ. And, and at the very end, the church will pass through a time of great destruction, but we will enter into a new world in that coming kingdom of God. There will be rest. God will get his rest. But before that comes, there's going to be a lot of sorrow and judgment first. Well, I think that's what we had for today.